Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, Fading Memories listeners. I so appreciate your ears today. With me is Renee Harmon. We are going to be talking about her book, Surfing the Wave of Alzheimer's, and somewhat specifically focusing on dealing with younger onset Alzheimer's. But thanks for joining me, Renee. You are welcome. Glad to be here. So tell us about you and, you know, how you came to be a caregiver and <clears throat> all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, it, I was a caregiver to my husband, Harvey, who was diagnosed at age 50 with younger onset Alzheimer's disease. Um, and it's younger onset is really just that. It's the definition is anyone who is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease younger than the age of 65. Um, so and as it's a very small percentage of all Alzheimer's uh, cases. I think three to five percent of all Alzheimer's is termed younger onset. And just terminology, we're trying to say younger onset now instead of early onset, because early onset is gets confused with early stage. So that's just that makes a, sense. Um, yeah. So they, I seem to talk to a lot of people whose loved one, their person, is younger. You know, they're not in their eighties. Mm -hmm. which is really interesting. My mom was not diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's, mostly because she refused to like go through some of the testing. She was diagnosed at 69, but by then it was like, pff, duh. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much anybody could have told you she had some form of dementia. It was, she was definitely mid-stage. So while she didn't have a formal diagnosis, I, my, my armchair uh, MD says that's what she had. Probably so. We're doing a better job of getting a diagnosis earlier as it's losing a bit of stigma. I think people are reaching for a diagnosis earlier. So I suspect we'll see younger cases kind of show up a little bit more, too. And we're we're more apt to talk about it um, because it's less of a stigma. And maybe in my generation um, than the older folks, that's an interesting, uh, interesting idea to think about. Yes, yeah, she was diagnosed in 2011. So. A lot has changed in the last 11 years. Yeah. Yeah. For the better. So that's good. Absolutely. But geez, diagnosed at 50, that, that gives me like the willies because I'm 55 and my mom mm. likely started showing signs at 52 and a half. So, mm. wow. you know, between 52 and 53, I was like, every time I forgot something, it was like, oh God, <laughs> it's a very little yeah. bit stressful. Yeah. Isn't and I was taking care of her. So it didn't help that, you know, caring for her, you know, and just she liked to sit around and shoot the breeze. That was her thing, which is just exhausting because you have to think four times harder than just having a normal conversation. So I would leave visiting with her and just feel wrecked. And it was, you know, and I'd feel wrecked for a day or so sometimes and I'd be like, yikes, I, wow. is my brain okay? <laughs> So like, well, I, I will tell you that Harvey was a physician, so he had a lot of cognitive reserve. So he was, I think he was able to cover it for years. Um, he, like when he was diagnosed, he reminded me that he had been complaining about his memory for the last two years, but I bet something was going on for him that I didn't see um, prior to even the two years. Yeah, they say that the the higher intelligence we have, the more coping reserves we have. So it sometimes in people that are really super highly accomplished and intelligent, you know, like physicians or scientists or other people that aren't like me, the um it, the progression seems really rapid because they seem fine, they seem fine and then all of a sudden bam, it's like what the heck happened? They're like mid-stage and, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of traumatic for those of us that have to care for them, but it's only because they've they've got more tools in their toolbox than the average person, which I don't know. Yeah. It's good and bad, I guess. No, I, I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. Um, Harvey's course was fairly quick. Um, it was eight years from the time he was diagnosed till the time he passed away. And that, that's fairly quick. And it, 
and like you said, it probably was more advanced and progressed quicker because, well, too, younger onset might be have a shorter course just because it's a more it might be more aggressive. The feeling, the thinking is the younger you are, the more aggressive it's going to be. Um, Which I've also heard. My mom had Alzheimer's for at least 20 years. So that kind of either she didn't have early onset, although she died at 77. So <laughs> you guys can do the math. Um, you know, even if even if we go from the diagnosis at 69, what is that, eight years? So that's that's more typical. But I mean, even my daughter, who was 16 at the time, knew her grandmother was I mean, it was bad. Yeah. She was getting lost. She couldn't drive anymore. I mean, it was bad. We were in the, we were in the, this is not great stage. So there, I mean, <laughs> it's like, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. This We're in the not so great stage right now. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it does so, take a long time to get a diagnosis, not as long as it took your mom and you, yeah. but um, <laughs> yeah, I think I read the average time um, from the, when the family first notices something to, to diagnosis in two years. Yeah, she was like three ish. She did all the testing to be a donor, a kidney donor for my dad. And she was rejected for cognitive impairment. And I thought that was in 2000, summer of 2008. And I thought, yeah. oh, we finally have a diagnosis. Yeah, and then ding, after, ding. yeah. And then after my dad died, so that was August of 2008, after my dad died and I, you know, became primarily responsible for mom. I told her general physician, I need to see like her doc, you know, her, um, not her documentation it makes her sound <laughs> like an immigrant, her <laughs> diagnosis, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, they didn't talk to me about this stuff. So I need to be filled in. I need to be caught up. And she wasn't diagnosed until September, like late September of 2011. So like three years and a month later. And even right. in 08, they, when they retired in 2005, I knew she had problems. She had, she had started taking orders from clients and not writing details or instructions or deadlines or anything useful like that. And so I started kind of supervising. I was trying to be kind of, you know, on the down low about that. Right. And there were times I had to intervene because clients would get super frustrated with her because they would tell her, you know, ABC. And then she'd be like, oh, okay, no problem. And, pfft, you know, that would go right. away. And then one day she didn't even recognize her own handwriting. I was like, oh, crap. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So that was prior to, I mean, they retired in April of 2005. So by 08 and um, 2011, like I said, it was, it was a big, yeah, no kidding. She has dementia. And my, I don't know if you remembered from prior conversations, my maternal grandmother had vascular dementia so my mom was extremely resistant to a diagnosis because she knew it was coming yeah. Yeah, the exactly. day she didn't didn't recognize her handwriting she said well i don't want to end up like my mother stomped on her foot and turned and huffed out of the room and i was like huh okay yeah. well let's see uh you're either gonna end up like your mother or you're gonna expect me to murder you Hmm, neither one of these are very good choices. I don't like this. Oh, denial is so powerful, isn't it? Oh, yes, my she was very good at that. And I actually think we may have gotten to a point, maybe not before they retired, that, you know, the point where they don't know what they don't know. So it's not necessarily yeah. denial. It's not knowing that they have a problem. Right. Right. I'm not really sure when she crossed that threshold because her denial was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, since you brought up genetics, um, let me kind of explain a little bit about younger onset Alzheimer's disease, because there is a heavy genetic component in some people. You, you might have heard there are these families. I think there's a family in Colombia, South mm -hmm. America. And if you get that, what we call a deterministic gene, then you will get Alzheimer's disease or younger onset Alzheimer's disease. It's the book and the movie Still Alice, the main character, had that genetic. But that's really only in less than half of people who are diagnosed with younger onset Alzheimer's. So that, that's just interesting. People think all younger onset might be like the Still Alice character, but it's less than the majority. So do we have any idea other than genetics why people are getting Alzheimer's? I mean, I know the family, there's that family in Colombia, they're studying them. Some of those family members get 
Alzheimer's in their like late 30s, early 40s. Know, is really that, freaky. Isn't that crazy? It's well, terrifying. We, yeah. I mean, there's still, we still know that there are these lifestyle that um, can increase your risk. And that would increase. Uh, uh, let me see. Let me put it this way. So when I asked Harvey's physician, um, he, how did he get this so young? Because he did everything right. He doesn't have the gene. He was a marathon runner. He ate right. His weight was great. He slept well. He kept his mind active. And the physician, the neurologist said to me, well, if he hadn't done all that, he might have gone it at age 35. Oh, that is even more scary. Which was scary, but not helpful, but kind of. So, yeah, he did have, Harvey did have some of the genes for older onset, and, and that just would increase his risk. He had some um, autoimmune issues, some weird autoimmune issues when he was a child, and you know, that maybe played a role in it, but nobody knows. Yeah, yeah. They, I wish, I wish the research was uh, further along. I know the Alzheimer's Association had a goal for finding the first survivor of Alzheimer's by 2025. Mm. I think they stopped saying that. <clears throat> yeah. You know, somewhere, I think somewhere during the pandemic, they were like, mm, we're just going to stop saying that because I think they're, I'm, they don't want to be negative, but <clears throat> I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. Well, it's really <laughs> difficult because the, once the damage is done, that's when you see symptoms, but the damage is done. You can't reverse break dead brain cells. So we've got to figure out a way to diagnose it in people before they have any symptoms, right? Yeah. And then figure out a drug that can, stop that buildup of amyloid before any symptoms even show up. And then we've got to follow these people for a long time in drug studies to see if it works. So it's, it's going to, it's going to be a task, but we're getting there. Well, I do know one thing that the Alzheimer's association accomplished that is beneficial that I'm not sure everybody is aware of is, and I'm not sure what age 65 for sure, maybe younger but 65 because that's the Medicare age is the number mm -hmm. that's popping into my head is um, you can, you can request and should be getting a cognitive screening every year. I believe it's at 65. It is. I would like my doctor to do that now at mm -hmm. 55 because of my family <laughs> history, because it's, we all know many of our loved ones can, you know, like fake it with, you know, non-family members, I'm sure you probably had instances where somebody was like, I don't know what you're talking about. Harvey's fine. Yeah. And we, yeah. We've all dealt with that. And so it that makes the diagnosis even harder. You know, if you're not documenting, recording, writing down just every strange thing that happens, and sometimes you don't realize they're they're kind of off and they're you realize they're off in hindsight, not like Oh, this is a very strange situation. You know, like my mom not recognizing her handwriting was obviously mm -hmm. a sign, but the not take not not writing down instructions on orders when that first started happening when she was 52 and a half, you know, it was easy to say, well, you know, somebody else came in, the phone rang, she had to use the bathroom. I mean, like, you know, you have a busy business, there's a hundred distractions. Like she sure. would never have assumed something was wrong with her mind. Not at Sure. Not at 52, not maybe even at 62, except that by then she was, she was forgetting a lot of other things. So that, you know, I, I think we should demand, and I got to, I got to preach to my own self on this one, you know, insist on a cognitive screening so that you have a baseline. Like here I am at 55, you know, and maybe in five years, if my husband's like, yeah, some strange things are going on, they at mm -hmm. least have like something to look back on. I mean, exactly. and it can't imagine that it's an expensive time, you know, all the reasons they wouldn't want to do it. I, I can speak to that. I, I am a physician as well. Um, oh, I my, forgot that. <laughs> yeah. Harvey and I were in practice together, actually, until he had to retire. But you're you're right. Um, a cognitive screen should be part of your annual wellness exam starting at age 65. And there's a lot of different things that the physician can do to qualify it being a cognitive screen. So there are, there are many simple tests. Um, I even had one physician tell me that it was a, that one screen would be to ask the patient, do you have any concerns about your memory? And then ask, has anybody in your family asked, had any concerns about your memory? I didn't find that to be particularly helpful, but 
doing a quick screen um, and then following up every year um, should be a part of your a, a part of the wellness exam. Now, I don't know about under the age of 65. We're, we're still talking really young, really low numbers, but you can always ask for, for one. Yeah, I got I got to work on that. What would a simple screen look like? Is that the pen and pencil or the pencil and paper test? The I forget what they call it, the Montreal Cognitive. Yeah, there's a lot of different ones. Um, The mini mental status exam is probably the one that's most commonly done, but there's a small version of that. And and they would all include asking the person to remember three items. Like They give you three items and then you have another task to do, another mental task to do. And then they ask you to remember and name those three items that you had previously been told. So that's always part of it. So as long as they don't ask me to remember the names of all the office staff, I have always been horrible with names. <laughs> that one I could do. And I don't have concerns about my memory. Actually, quite the contrary, it seems. I don't know. It seems like it's actually gotten a little bit better. I hope that's not just a fantasy. Okay. But so you you guys were in practice together and you got had you had both had to retire. I guess you had to retire so you could take care of him. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about neuro reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Yeah, no, actually, um, he retired. I continued to work. He was able to be home alone for four years, actually, did really well. Um, and then two years with paid home care and then two years in memory care units. But um, I, I am really glad that I was able to continue to work. It, it really helped me stay sane. Um, yeah. And so and we definitely... And it, 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 gave me something positive to do and interactive to do and helpful to do uh, with, with patients. And I only recently retired after he passed away. I, I really feel like we need to have more conversations about supporting caregivers in a way. And I know, you know, we're, this is just a giant uphill battle, but it, it worries me the people that have to quit working and they're home 24 seven with somebody who. You know, I mean, toddlers improve. Like I, my daughter daughter went to work with us. So I was so excited when she started going to preschool and, Mm -hmm. you know, but she interacted with us and clients. I mean, she was part of the, the inter the day-to-day interaction in the business and stuff. And a cute story that I don't think I've ever told on this podcast is one day when I think she was like five and she pushed a rolling step stool up to the counter and asked this client, can I help you? And they're like, uh, maybe (laughs) it was so cute, you know, and she's got this greatest work ethic, but when you're home and you're dealing with somebody who, you know, is losing abilities and, you know, your life is shrinking, shrinking, shrinking. I really worry about, you know, especially the younger caregivers who've had to leave the workforce prematurely that may want to go back. I mean, it just. I don't think, I don't know. We need to do something better with that one somehow or else, you know, it's going to impact our entire society and um, economy and all that, all that lovely stuff, which that's probably a whole other episode. (laughs) So you wrote a book called 
surfing the wave of Alzheimer's? Yes. This, so okay. I want to make sure that memoir. wasn't the subtitle. <laughs> no, the subtitle is, since you brought that up, um, Principles of Caregiving That Kept Me Upright, right? So we know that Alzheimer's is going to throw a lot of waves at us and we have to learn how to surf, right? Because the waves are going to come. Yep. So I organized the memoir chronologically. It, I mean, it's told chronologically, but it's organized around different caregiving principles. And so I illustrate a caregiving principle, then discuss with story, and then discuss the principle. And then there are practices in the book that the reader might choose to do to kind of solidify that practice. It's all, it's all easier to practice when you're calm and when you're not dealing with somebody whose brain is always challenging you. So what were some of the biggest tools that you that you used to stay upright? Yeah, right. Um, I, I kind of put it into three main categories. Um, so one is enter their world. If you can learn to enter their world, think like they do, you can interact more appropriately and easily then if you continue to try to bring them into your world, because they can't, they cannot enter your world. It's impossible. So it behooves us as fair caregivers to enter their world. And in that bigger umbrella, there are caregiving principles like he's not giving you a hard time. He's having a hard time, which just means it's the disease. And we know that, you know, but <laughs> we always forget. And then the, the one that my care, my, um, support group talked about most often was um, it's better to be kind than correct. That is true. Just just a mantra you have to live by or you'll go crazy. I had a um, past guest a couple of years ago, maybe further back. um, That whole pandemic things. I'm still not sure what year it is anymore. Right. But she, you know, she was, her husband was asking the same question over and over and she sighed and like, turned around and answered for the, you know, seventh time. And the sigh made him feel so bad Aww. when she turned around. She, mm-hmm. she said it looked like she'd slapped him. And from Aww. that point forward, she was always like, she would remind herself if he could remember the answer, he wouldn't ask me again. And he did not ask to get Alzheimer's. And that was mm-hmm. probably a mantra that just kept going through her head over and over and over. And, you know, Absolutely. I, you know, my mom made it hard to be in her world because she'd always, like I said, she liked to sit around, and, you know, chit chat. Mm-hmm. She always asked me, what have you been up to lately? So it was really, you know, you'd answer, I'd answer that question. I'd ch- I'd break up the day into the you know, small chunks, you know, like, yeah. so it'd be like one. I didn't tell her, oh, I went to the gym and the meeting. Da, 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 da. I would break it all up. And then once we got to the end of everything I'd done, I would try to, you know, ask her, well, what have you been up to? And I would just get like a, oh, you know, same old, same old. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is not helpful. And it took me a long, way too long to learn that trick because, I mean, I, I kind of went with what she was doing, but I I do think that my brain was throwing up resistance because, you know, that we're normal. But the one day when she told me her brothers were normal people now, my brothers are normal people now. I was like, oh, really? (laughs) That's great. And I'm thinking, what the hell did that come from? You know, like, this is so <laughs> funny. And, you know, she had forgotten her sister who she had one brother that didn't visit at all. The other brother brought the sister and was like, how can you forget your sister when she comes with one of the brothers? And it was just crazy. But yet it that was that's mm-hmm. not as easy as people would think. Right. You have to you just have to go with it. And uh, I just wrote a blog post that I published this week. How um, improv. You know, performing improv is a good way to think of it. You're thrown into a situation and a conversation and you just have to go with it. You you can't bring them to your world. You have to get into their world and just go with it wherever you wherever they take you. Um, One of these days I'm going to find an improv artist to talk to and like learn some of those skills because yeah. I've I've heard that. and not being any kind of actress, not a skill that I really have, but with my mom, and I think this is really common for those of us that are taking care of a parent, is you're trying to be respectful. It's like your parent, your mother. And so all of this, you know, 
chuck and jive, you know, just like <laughs> smoke and mirrors. It yeah. feels bad because you feel like you're you're lying or you're being deceptive or, you know, you're just you even subconsciously. I think it feels very disrespectful because you would yeah. not do that to her if her mind was fine. Well, so that I, that was I, what I learned that actually from caregivers and people who were volunteering at respite care. And I realized that people who did not know Harvey when he was at full capacity could enter into his world much easier than I could. And just watching them and how they interacted with him and other persons living with dementia was really eye-opening. And that's when I kind of learned what, oh, that's what you mean. But I think it's much difficult, much more difficult for us who have known our loved one, like in your case, all your life, to suddenly treat them differently. Yeah. And, it, you know, and they say things like, you know, we'll simplify the hobbies they love to do. And I tried that. Man, that was epic failure. And I don't know if I was trying too hard or she was too mm -hmm. far along. But, oh, yeah, yeah. It was just like, that's why I started the podcast. Because I'm like, mm -hmm. all these normal suggestions, re recommendations, things they tell you to do. None of these are working. I have to find better ways. So I've talked to, to over 250 people at this point. <laughs> and I wish, you know, I mean, she passed away at the beginning of the pandemic, which was very much a blessing because I seriously think I would have lost my mind if, if I had been prevented from seeing her for months. Um, yeah. I didn't get to see her the last two weeks of her life, and that was hard enough. I did see her the day before she died and 10 of us ended up there the day she died, which the poor executive mm -hmm. director was, was having a coronary, but he was very kind. He didn't tell us, please take our conversation to the parking lot, <laughs> which he had every right to do. I mean, it was March 31st, 2020. Wow. So nobody knew what the heck was going on with this COVID wow. thing or, you know, it was just, it was massive confusion at that point, uncertainty and fear. But, you know, she wasn't able to do window visits or yeah. FaceTime or Zoom. None of that. That was that was beyond her. And I don't I don't know what I would have done, but there are I'm still learning how to be a better caregiver. So I kind of feel like, OK, I'll keep sharing because if I'm learning good things, then the audience is learning good things. Yeah. So what other so enter their, their enter reality. Their world. And then um, my second one that I really stress is build your build a caregiving team and that is just recognizing who is on your team already and be thankful and grateful for them but then start thinking outside the box and thinking about who actually can help you and learn how to accept and ask for help because you cannot do it alone it takes a village all of that you know it is so hard for people it was hard for me i don't know that i ever asked for help but I learned to accept help because I was vulnerable and would just tell my friends kind of what was going on. And they would just sometimes jump in and say, Hey, well, I'll, I can go do that for you. Or I'll, I'll sit with Harvey so that you can go do that. Um, so that, that's a big option. Do you have anything to share there? Did you have a team that helped with your mom or were you doing it alone? Well, she was in memory care from, like my dad died March 2nd and she went into memory care March 16th, which felt bad, but I knew it was the best choice for all of us. Mm -hmm. And that's true because she had friends in memory care and did things there that she would not do with me. So that was always interesting and frustrating, but at least she did them. But one of the things I learned from another caregiver who is also a podcaster is to, um, and I, I've simplified it because their family is the poster family for how, er, how we should go about this. And right. since most of us are not blessed with family uh -huh. like theirs, <laughs> you know, it's like, um, I tell uh -huh. people make, a, make a list of all the tasks you have to do today, yeah. all the weekly tasks, all the monthly tasks, mm -hmm. and then make a list of everybody that, you know, they don't mm -hmm. have to be immediately local. You know, they right. could even be in another state. And write down what you think their best task is. And what this other podcaster did, their family all got together. They had like a board meeting. And literally, that's what they called it. Yeah. And they they would ask each other, well, what do you feel capable of doing? What do you, well, you know, what what can you do? What can't you do? What what do you have time for? What you don't have time for? So I've distilled that into, you know, write down what you, you know, like what you think 
mm-hmm. your aunt or your friend or whomever can do. And then when that person says, oh, my gosh, I'm so sorry to hear about Harvey or, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, Jen, about your mom. Is there anything I could do to help? Bang, you have an answer exactly. <laughs> instead of instead of, oh, thank you. Well, we're OK for now. And then, you know, yeah. a lot of people don't volunteer to help because they're afraid they're going to get sucked in. And they're like, mm-hmm. I got 500 things to do. And it's like, mm-hmm. I, I can help, you know, Renee with this or Jen mm-hmm. with that. but you know, wow, yeah. they might ask for more stuff. And so if you kind of process it that way, it you're asking somebody to do something that they're comfortable with and it won't overwhelm them. So they'll, right. they'll come back and help more. <laughs> and I do think people, some people do want to help and they don't really know what to offer. And so they'll say something like, what can I do to help? And to the caregiver, I don't know if you felt this way. It kind of felt um, like one more burden. Okay. Now mm-hmm. you want me to think of something for you to do. Um, and if you have a, like a little handy list in your back pocket, that you can pull out and say, you know, Tuesday night dinner would be really nice. If you just drop it on the front porch or could you cut my grass on Saturday or something specific and small that doesn't have to be repeated. Like you just said, otherwise it's overwhelming, but, um, yeah, yeah, if they do I, Tuesday, Tuesday night dinner, they might realize that, hey, this is easy. I'll just, you know, double the recipe and do Tuesday night dinner all the time because it makes exactly. them feel good. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, I do something similar when, Jen, when I present, um, I do several presentations and, and, and workshops, but um, I have a, a handout called Asset Maps, and I ask the participants to write down everybody they know, just like you did, but in, in these concentric circles of close family and friends and neighbors, professionals, um, community resources. And then I have a sheet that lists all the tasks that I could think of that need to be done in a household where they have dementia. And I get them to try to match it up and see where the holes are and where the skill sets are and not are, because you can't do it alone. You just Mm -mm. cannot. No, and I think people are, I think that message is is becoming more accepted. I think part of it is because we have, believe the number is like 25% of family caregivers are millennials, which mm. my daughter's a millennial, so I still think of them as like young people, but she'll be 31 <laughs> this year. So yeah. that's not old, but it's not, you know, she says like a lot of people still think of millennials as teenagers. And mm. I've gotten past the teenager part, but you, when I hear millennial, I still don't think like, you know, adults with their own families and jobs and careers and da 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 da. You just, I don't know, because yeah, she's my millennial, so actually, so is the son-in-law. But, um, you know, it's just twenty-five. If twenty-five percent of them are taking care of somebody, you know, they're they're. It's just wow. a different generation than the baby boomers who are like, you know, we don't want to talk about this. You know, this. You know, I want to be mm-hmm. respectful to my spouse, and we're not going to talk about this. And you know, I can do this. I took a vow, right. and it's like. And we're, no. we're self-sufficient and strong yeah. and we can do it ourselves. Thank you very oh. much. <laughs> yes. We don't want to be a burden to anybody. Right. That's right. the one that kills me. My mom always said, I don't want to be a burden to you girls. And I want to live in my home forever. Like, hello. Okay. <laughs> like, okay. That goes back to the, um, the choice of not being like your mother or me murdering you. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. this, this is not an option that I have any control over here. So yeah, it was, just crazy. Yeah. But, you know, fortunately people are accepting more help, but I don't know if you've heard, I'm sure you've heard the statistic that 65% of caregivers um, are hospitalized or die before the person they're caring for. And logically we think those are the people caring for a spouse or maybe an older um, adult taking care of a much older parent. That statistic, that percentage has not changed even when you factor in millennials. Wow. When I That's heard that, mm-hmm. I dang near fell out of my chair. Well, that leads me to my third main point that I want to bring <laughs> in the book is um, put your own oxygen mask on first. You know, that's so counterintuitive. When I first heard that on the airplane, you know, years ago, I thought, you know, that's just so counterintuitive. You're going to want to, you want to protect your child. You want to protect your fur person first. But if you don't take care of yourself, you cannot take care of your loved one who's living with dementia. You just have to take care of your own needs. 
And number one of that is getting a team in place so that you're not doing everything. I think the taking care of your own needs feels so selfish. It's like, I'm healthy, I'm capable. You know, my mom, she didn't ask for Alzheimer's. You know, she should have been hanging out with the grandkids and traveling and doing all the crap my dad didn't want to do while he was alive. She should have been doing all of that. And yeah. so it it was because she was in memory care. And I, when my dad was in the hospital, my mom bounced around between her house and my house and my sister's house. And the more that that happened over the month, the more agitated and, and you know, de hard to deal with she became. Even the dog was getting aggressive. It was not fun. <laughs> I, you know, and then when I, but, you know, right before my dad died, his best friend looked at me and says, well, now your dad assumes your mom will come live with you. And I had to like seriously bite my tongue because mm -hmm. it was not, this is a clean podcast, so I cannot repeat what went through my brain, but you guys can all figure that out. But because of the challenges, just having her in my house for two or three days at a time, I'm like, there is no way. My daughter also moved out literally a month before my dad moved, died. So I'm like, uh, I have not had any empty nest syndrome. I have not had a chance to like, do the stuff that I had planned on. And I knew I'm like one week, mom be here one week. One of us will be dead. Maybe both of us. <laughs> it might be a murder suicide situation. Cause I just knew I'm like, there's no way. And I was 50. Like I'm not interested in spending the next 15 years of my life. Do you practice self care by not getting your mom moved into your house? You know, yeah. That that was yeah. not good for you. But it still felt, you know, it took me a while. I'm like, well, I'm not a caregiver because mom's in memory care. And it wasn't until no, I attended no. my first support group when the facilitator, of which I am now a support group facilitator, she said, e you're a caregiver, even if your person is in memory care. And I was like, oh, OK. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah. and it just that made a huge difference. But, yeah, it's like, you know, especially if they're you're a younger caregiver, a millennial or, you know. Like even at 50 is not particularly old. We, my husband and I are still working. You, you got to figure out how to move forward, but not, I mean, I see so many people when I occasionally peek on the Facebook pages and it's like, yes, the reason you want to scream is because you've given up everything. Yeah. And now yeah. you're stuck because you don't have help and you, you're not sure which one of the two of you you're going to kill first yourself or them. Yeah. You know, it's just like, yeah. don't get into that position but it's hard because it really really feels selfish well i mean it felt selfish putting my mom in memory care even though i knew <laughs> intellectually i knew this is the best thing for everybody me my sister my mom and mom mom proved that to be right my mom was one of three dianes that hung out together that was confusing as hell for those of us with normal brain <laughs> <laughs> and they were they were a force you know and they just they they sat around, shot the breeze, and, you know, I took one, like, there was frequently I would take mom and some, one of the other Dianes out. We'd go to the regional park. We'd go get our nails done. One day, the other, one of the other Dianes, she really wanted a hamburger. I'm like, fine, let's go to McDonald's, which not, I have not eaten at McDonald's in a hundred years, but I took them there because there was a play area, and I thought, oh, we can go watch children. Yeah. There were no children there that day, so yeah. <laughs> that backfired, but. And the benches were very uncomfortable. I had to hear about that 15 times. <laughs> but they dealt with each other. Yeah. And I could just participate in their conversation. That was much easier to be in their reality, or at least on the periphery, than it was yeah. when it was just mom and I. Yeah. Yeah. It helps to kind of spread the wealth. And the... Can they, I'd like to tell you my story of how I decided... Uh, to place Harvey in memory care, because I think that's important for people to to hear and to get permission if when it's the right time and the right place to do it, just do it. Like like you said, you you felt tremendous guilt in doing that. So um, I had decided ahead of time because I was still working what my um, uh, breaking point would be. And it, for me personally, it was if my sleep is interrupted to the point that I can't function well the next day, that's when I know it's time. And that's exactly what happened because I had already decided that ahead of time, I was ready. So I always kind of recommend people do that. What is your breaking? What is it? And, and you, you knew just family dynamics. It just wasn't going to work. Yeah, no, once, that's a good one. I, if, once I I get, knew that, mm -hmm. if I get one crappy night's sleep, I wake up and my brain's going, 
let's have donuts in Danish. And I it's like, know. no brain, that crap will not make you feel more awake. That will just make us feel cruddy. So no, we're going to have a nice, healthy breakfast. We'll do a light workout and we have to have a nap after lunch. Then we'll take a nap. But no, we're not having donuts. <laughs> so weird and would you would you want your physician to show up having not slept well the night before i don't God, think no. so no, no but i tell all. you what fine i still felt guilty you know we all do i mean we all do that is just completely normal so i still felt guilty as heck about it but it was um the place where I ended up choosing for him, I chose mainly because the directors there said these words to me. We will care for him so that you can just love him. And that was so huge for me. And that's exactly what happened. I didn't have to get him bathed. I didn't have to get him dressed. I didn't have to get him fed and cleaned up. I could just show up and dance with him and sing with him and play with him and love him. And that was the beauty for me of memory care. My my mom's memory care said, we, we can accommodate mom's dog. <laughs> mm. Yeah, which, you know, which they did for half the time she was there. Um, the dog had eventually ended up becoming more of a an appendage to my mom and and a problem. And it the dog weighed twice what she should have weighed, which meant there was hygiene issues and it was just not fun. And when they renovated and put in new carpet, they were like, we're going to be putting in new carpet. And I'm like, oh, so you'd like me to rehome the dog? Well, uh, you know, mm. blah, blah, blah. I'm like, they never asked me to get rid of the dog. But mm. I, I make that joke because I didn't do the research and check licensing and Google reviews and, you know, state whatever. None of that <laughs> didn't do any of it. I just went on gut instinct and thank God yeah. that worked fine. But yeah, they said, you know, yeah. when you when you put somebody in somebody else's care outside your home, you get to resume the relationship that you had pri previously. You got to be the spouse. I got to, well, I wasn't the daughter, but I was the best friend, mm -hmm. which, hey, that was fine. I mm -hmm. didn't mind that, you know, so it's, it's, and it's, I think people are afraid it's like giving up on them. Like you're just dumping yeah. them. No. It's like, no, no, I'm sure you felt like you were the captain of Harvey's care team. They got That's to do the heavy point. lifting, but you were in charge still. Right. I was still his advocate, made sure things got done that needed to get done. And he got, yeah, absolutely. You don't just like shove them off in another place and forget about them. I guess some I mean, people you, do, but. Oh. Again, you could, but I don't think <laughs> yeah. most of us are, are quite wired that way. So, yeah, no, I just wish that we had more options with memory care mm. because it's just so expensive. I know, and, I know, and I, and I, I know. And they don't pay the workers very well. So the staff turnover is huge. But if they paid the care workers more, then it'd be even more expensive for us. So I don't know the, what the solution is. I don't either, but we need to find one. Because yeah. obviously this problem's not getting better. It's just going to get worse until we find a preventative or a cure or something, a treatment, something. We got to keep up on the research. So now you talked about this asset map, I think you talked. Yeah. Where can people find your book and you and all this good stuff? Sure. So the book is available on Amazon or any of your bookstores. If you go to the bookstore and ask uh, them to order it, they, they can order it through my distributor. But it's Surfing the Waves of Alzheimer's. Um, I have a website, too, ReneeHarmon.com, and where I have a weekly blog and I have um some web uh, webinars and speeches and stories that I've told so you can access uh, some of that and just a list of where I'm appearing next. Um, awesome. So that, well, I'll make, yeah. I'll make sure that your website is linked in the show notes so people can just scroll down, click. It's a hot link and it'll take you right there, right on your device, wherever you're listening to this. Um, unless it's an Alexa that I have zero clue because I don't have one of those because I'm an Apple person. <laughs> But um, do you have any parting wisdom you'd like to share with the audience before I let you go off into your your busy day? Oh, I just, just keep your balance. Just do whatever it takes to keep your balance on this surfboard that is Alzheimer's disease. And, I, you know, I, surfing is a solitary sport. 
But when you're surfing the waves of Alzheimer's, it's a team sport. They're there to help you keep your balance on your surfboard. So use those team members. I guess I should ask, do you actually surf? No. Is that just a, just, okay. So, yeah, one of the stories in the book is like the one time I tried to surf, I dislocated my shoulder. So, oh, no. No. <laughs> no, 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 that's bad. That's that's we don't want to do that. I, I might we live on a lake now and I might take up windsurfing. But there's not oh. a lot of breeze. But that's yeah. okay, because then it would be very, very calm. How about paddleboarding? Did, yeah, that's, that's I'm that's another thing I'm contemplating. It's just those I need to borrow somebody's paddleboard before mm. I invest in one because those suckers oh. aren't cheap. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And I heard somebody we had a dinner party the other night and they were talking about inflatable ones. I'm like, that sounds like a great idea. Cause then one storage is, you know, much right. easier and Carting it to the lake is much easier. And they're like, yeah, those aren't cheap either. I'm like, <laughs> no. like what hobby is yep. cheap? So yep. anyway, well, I appreciate this conversation. This was really fun. A little less structured than the last couple I've done. Um, Cause those were on like very specific topics. So this is kind of a okay. nice change of pace oh, and good. I appreciate it. And definitely grab Renee's book and check out her blog. Cause she's a very good storyteller and I'm sure that we'll, Learn more good things by doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.